All right, we'll get started. Seven o'clock, a little bit after. Start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again uh, for the opportunity we have to gather in your name, uh, knowing and trusting that you are amongst us. And we ask for your guidance. We ask uh, for you to teach us and to lead us as we continue this discussion, just so that we have understanding. And once again, uh, we ask that you enable us to uh, approach these things with humility and that there's things that we need to learn. There's things that we uh, always need to learn about you, about your word, and that ultimately our goal is to come to understanding and that we can come to understanding and we can come to obedience uh, in your strength and with your help. And that is uh, hopefully our desire. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to continue the discussion, hopefully finish this discussion tonight on choosing a good translation, and then we might get into a little bit uh, the epistles next, because uh, that section is going to be long, uh, and uh, uh, for that one, you'll definitely probably want to have notebooks and uh, your Bible with you. Some of it is going to be very, very difficult to teach in this setting, especially when we get into like outlining a book of the Bible. Uh, I'm, trying to kind of, I'm still kind of trying to figure out how to do that, the way this is, we're set up here, because uh, that makes it a little bit more complicated, and uh, so that you'll just have some understanding. Because if you can learn to outline a book of the Bible, then you don't necessarily have to memorize every specific verse and chapter kind of thing, but if you have a good idea of what each book is about and kind of the basic setup of each book, then finding things in the Bible becomes much, much easier. Uh, you know, if you have, some, oh, where, where was that? And then you just kind of think about the topic that you're thinking about, and then you can sometimes find it if you know that. And uh, it also just helps us get a bigger overall understanding of uh, what each book is saying. And the epistles, we're, we're, going to, we're going to the epistles again first after this section, just because they are the ones that people read the most. And, uh, and because they are letters, uh, having that understanding of what we're reading when we read the epistles, and basically the epistles are everything that's not a gospel in the New Testament. Uh, Acts to Revelation are letters. And so uh, it's really important for us to have an understanding of that. Right? But tonight we're going to continue, and we talked about text last week. Carrie, can you move that sensor a little bit? Do you have the power proclaim on top, not Facebook? If proclaim's not on top, it don't work. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Yeah, you can't, you wouldn't be able to answer questions from there because. It, I can't change the screen if you're on the Facebook page first. All right, so we talked about text, and now we're going to talk about language. And language has to do with the theory of translation and converting it from the original language to the receptor language, which is, of course, for us, English. And there's, there's different theories about what you're trying to accomplish in a translation in the sense of what a translation is trying to do. I, I know we have this thought in our head that, <laughs> that these, these scholars are sitting here taking word for word. Well, if you did that, you ain't going to understand anything uh, because of how it would appear in English. And, and this, this is not just true for ancient languages like, you know, Biblical Hebrew, Aramaic, and, and Koine Greek. It is true for languages today. If you take any language and you translated it word to word into English, it ain't going to make a whole lot of sense. And... So they, they have to come up with theories in what are we trying to do to move it from its original language to the biblical language. And that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here. And some of these issues has to do with uh, the verbs and the grammatical issues. You know, the transferring of words and ideas from one language to another language, and it's not easy. It's, you know, you gotta, you got to figure out, well, this is what they said in their language, and what did they mean, and how can I put that in English where the person who's reading this translation can possibly understand what I'm trying to say? And we'll look at the different, different theories of this translation, and then it also tells us a little bit about what we need to know when choosing a translation of the Bible, okay? 
So some I'm going to give you some terms, and again, just because these might, may or may not be terms that you use every day, doesn't let that frustrate you. In English, we learn new words every day. And uh, you know, like I said before, some of you remember when words like internet would have been foreign to us. Uh, even cafe mocha would have been foreign, you know, about 40 years ago. So, uh, somebody, you know, people would have said, you either have coffee or you don't have coffee. Then, you know, all these other kind of coffees, nobody knows what they mean. So, anyway, so the original language, of course, this is the language that the Bible was written into the day it was written. And we've talked about this. This is Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Not modern Greek, not modern Hebrew. Uh, it is an older form of those. Then you have the modern or receptor language. That is the language that is receiving uh, the translation. And, uh, and for us, of course, this is English, but the Bible has been translated in many, many languages in the world. This may be interesting to you. There are still 6,000 languages that do not have any form of the Bible translated in them today. And uh, if I could have done anything when I, when I left Bible school and in my missionary work, I would have been a Bible translator. I just wasn't good enough uh, in, in Greek. I mean, you've got to be really good in your biblical languages to do something like that, and I just didn't think that I was good enough to, to, to be able to do that. Uh, the average translation of the New Testament takes someone six to ten years. Okay? When these missionaries go into these tribal languages or these, these groups of people and they're trying to translate the Bible into their language, six to ten years on average just for the New Testament. And so it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, I, I have a lot of respect for, for, for Wycliffe, and, Wycliffe and, and, and people like that who do biblical translation. Okay, then historical distance. When we use this term, we're talking about the differences in the two languages. Okay? There's 2,000 years and lots of cultural issues, grammatical issues, uh, linguistic issues in between these languages, and that is called historical distance. It includes words, grammar, metaphors, uh, uh, culture, history, everything, translating it from then to now. And again, we, we face that, we face this now, uh, whether you're translating anything. I mean, uh, when we were in Eastern Europe, we had the Church of God... Uh, it's called the SIMS program, the Certificate in Ministerial Studies program. We had that translated into Serbian. And, you know, the, my translator was, you know, constantly calling me and saying, what does that mean? Because I don't know how to express that in Serbian. And, uh, and it was a thing of, you know, seeing that, that complication there, okay? Now, types of translations. There are three major types of translations, and we'll talk about each one of them. The one is called formal formal equivalent translation. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as a literal translation, but I think that's a very, very poor choice of words just because there is no such thing as a literal translation. You can't translate something literally from one language to another. Uh, and it, but it is an attempt to keep the translation as close as possible uh, to the original language. Okay? And again, there's no translation that is actually literal. In this, historical distance is maintained. That's a very important key of what is known as a formal equivalent or literal translation. And as we go through this, I will go back and forth with each of these terms because I want you to kind of become familiar that they're the same thing. Okay? But they're trying to, to no, no attempt to, to connect the distance. Okay? The goal is using modern language that is comparable to the original language and the and, 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 and meaning of the author's original intent, okay? If you read a King James or New King, King James translation, that is the most literal translation of the Bible in the sense of they didn't make attempts to, to, to create the distance. Now, some of it, again, is because of, again, the manuscripts they had available and also the translator's understanding of history, Okay? We know a whole lot more about biblical culture and biblical, in antiquity, not just biblical history, but you know, history during that time now than the King James translators knew then. And so now closing that gap is actually even easier than it would have been for them, but there was, there was no, no, very little attempt, and we'll see that as we go along, and you'll see what I'm talking about. The second type 
It's called functional equivalent. So you have formal equivalent, functional equivalent. This is also known as a dynamic translation. Here, the attempt is to keep the original language meaning, but use words, ideas, and idioms for the receptor language. That would be normal use. It brings understanding, okay? And uh, one of the big differences between the two is because it's, they're not trying to close the gap of historical dis distance. Uh, functional equivalent translations are easier to understand for the modern reader, okay? They sustain historical distance, but with updated language and updated grammar. Okay. And then the third, and if I start going too fast, just raise your hand, I'll slow down. And again, the PowerPoints, all that, I can make them available if you would like. That's no big deal. I can even make them into a PDF form. Uh, the only thing about it is if you try to print them, it'll have that color background, and if you're printing them at home, you'll you, you'll use all your ink up, you know, but, uh, all right. The next one is called a free translation or a paraphrase translation. Same thing, free or paraphrase. This attempts to translate the ideas from the original language to the modern language, but there's less worry about using the exact words of the original language, okay? There is the attempt to remove historical different distance, yet at the same time trying to keep the intent of the original text. Now the danger in a free or paraphrased translation is that it's too free, and at times it's not faithful to the meaning of the original text and how it was intended. And I'll, I'll probably say this a few times tonight, oftentimes a free translation or a paraphrased translation almost becomes more of a commentary than it does actually a, a good translation of the Bible. And so of these three, these are the three major types of tra biblical translations, and whatever translation you read falls somewhere in here. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean whatever translation you're using is directly under one of these, okay? It can be in between the two, and I've tried to create a graph. <laughs> this is the best I could do on PowerPoint or on Keynote, uh, to kind of explain where we're at here, okay? So you see formal equivalent or literal, okay? King James, New King James is definitely under that category. And then you go all the way to free paraphrase where you've got like the message in, in, in Bible translations like that, which are definitely falling under the, the free category. And then everything in between. And uh, where you see NIV and NIV 2011, again, remember that it has been updated and the 2011 version is the one uh, that most of the time you would probably see now, and it's the one that we use here in the church. Uh, I'm going to go through what these initials mean. Now, you might look up and say, well, my Bible's not up there. <laughs> there was no way I could get every English translation up here. Uh, so I basically uh, gathered together uh, some of the more common ones uh, that are used, especially within academic circles, Bible schools, things like that, okay? So NASB is New American Standard Bible. You don't have to write these down if you don't want. Uh, HCSB is the Holman Christian Standard Bible. The NAB is the New American Bible. The NJB is the New Jerusalem Bible. Okay, don't get excited. That's a French, uh, from a French version. GNB is the Good News Bible. The REB is the Revised English Bible. The JB is the Jerusalem Bible. So you have the New Jerusalem Bible and the Jerusalem Bible. The NEB, the New English Bible. And the LB, the Living Bible. And I think the other ones you probably know. Now there's, there's ones up there that you might not, I mean if you don't know what ESV, that's just the English Standard Version, uh, which is a uh, little bit on the right side yeah, right side of a, a dynamic translation, all right? All right. So, in my opinion, okay, this is my opinion. This is not thus saith the Lord, as Paul points out when he's talking about marriage, okay? Uh, in my opinion, the best translations remain faithful to both the original language and the receptor language, our language, okay? 
Because ultimately, what, we're, what are we trying to do when we, we find a Bible translation? We're trying to find a translation we understand, okay? And if we don't understand it, it's not helping us to read it. And so there's a lot of people who, who, read, who are reading a translation, they don't understand, okay? Because of the way it was translated. It's not that they don't understand the Word of God. Remember, the Word of God is not written in the English language. The Word of God is written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and is not... It has been translated into our language, and so we've we got to keep that in the forefront and not forget that. So when a choice has to be made, the version that I recommend m moves in favor of the modern language without losing the original meaning. Okay? You can't go too far, but you, you, your goal in reading the Bible and studying the Bible is understanding I don't think anybody reads the Bible and think, I don't understand that, but I'll just read it anyway, okay? Uh, I mean, I, I know some of you might have fought your way through numbers, okay, <laughs> even though you don't really want to read it, just so you can say, I read the whole Bible, and you, just, you, know, you skipped all the begetting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, actually, very, it might, might be interesting to you, might not. In many African countries, their favorite book of the Bible is Numbers. So, yeah, think about that. They like genealogy, is why. So, uh, I, the purpose of the translation is so that the modern reader, who does not know the original language, can read, understand, accept, and obey the Bible. That is our goal. So we need to find a version of the Bible that we can read, understand, accept, and definitely obey. Okay? All right? So... Personally, in my opinion, my recommendation is that you find a functional equivalent or a dynamic translation. And yes, I will make my recommendations at the end of this, and you can do with them what you will. Uh, this is this that this will be your primary Bible, a functional. Why? Because you're going to understand it more. Okay, and it's going to have it's going to have used some of the better. Manuscripts available, it's going to use the older manuscripts, it's going to use more manuscripts, okay? Then as a secondary Bible, then I would say choose a formal equivalent or a literal translation as your second Bible. Yes, I think you should have more than one, and we talked about that. That sometimes if you read it in different translations, you, oh, okay, I get what he's trying to say there. I missed it in, in this translation, but this translation I kind of picked up on it. It'll help you. Now, you can buy... What they call, I, 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 I looked, uh, me and Alan had this discussion some time ago, and, we, and I went and looked, and it's still, they still have it. It's called a parallel Bible, where it'll have not just one. I think it actually has four translations, okay? Now, they're not all great translations, because I remember two or three of them being almost the same type, but, you know, where you can sit there and you can look back and forth at which, uh, you know, you can look at the NIV and look at the, you know, the New King James and that kind of stuff and see the differences there where you had it all in one but I think most parallel Bibles are only New Testament because you're, you know, it would be this thick you know if it was all four of them of, of the whole of the other ones okay uh, I mean for example I have a parallel Bible in my office if you ever want to look at it it's Arabic and English uh, Arabic on one side and English on the other side the only thing you got to remember is you turn the other way because Arabic you read from right to left and uh, I, I forget where I think I got that in Bethlehem or somewhere but. and then your third Bible then you get a free paraphrase version for your third Bible okay so I am recommending that you have three now I will say this if you read digitally so much of this is available online there's there's free Bible apps that you can get translations of the Bible on I use Bible Gateway quite a bit uh, because it's got so many different translations and I sometimes I'll just go down through them and see how each one of them kind of put something uh, to look at, but some first would be functional equivalent, dynamic, then formal equivalent, literal, then paraphrase, okay? Now, the problem with formal equivalent translations, literal translations, is the historical distance is maintained, and it's maintained in places like language and grammar, making it almost impossible to understand for the modern reader. And again, if you don't spend a lot of your time reading stuff that's been translated from ancient texts to modern ones, or even reading ancient, I mean, 400-year-old uh, English literature anyway, uh, 
A, a good example is go find original copies and original works of John Owen or the Puritans and try to read them. And if you can't understand that, then you're not understanding the King James Version because that's basically the type of English he's writing in. And it, it, but the thing about it is it's not just the language, it's the translation. So when they translated from Greek to 400-year-old English, they didn't put it in the way people talk then. They tried to translate it in the grammar from the original, and it doesn't make sense a lot of times because of that. And I'm going to give you some examples. Okay? It was translated into ways uh, the modern speaker doesn't talk and doesn't write. And in fact, some of times it's translated in, in, into ways in which they didn't talk or write because they were trying to do it word for word and it just didn't make out. Uh, so I'm going to give you an example in Chinese. There is a word in Chinese called dianao. Okay? It means, if you translate it directly, literally, like the King James Version was trying to translate from the original language into English. It would, it, it would translate electric brain. What does that mean? If I told you, go and use your electric brain, what do you think I'm talking about? Huh? A computer. Very good. You're maybe part Chinese, Ed. <laughs> yes, it means a computer. Okay, because in Chinese... They, they, didn't want to, they, don't, they don't come up with new words. They take old words and put the, you know, two old words and put them together. And so they're, to say computer, it was electric and brain. And I remember the first time I, I looked it up, like, electric brain? You know, what are you talking about, electric brain? And that's what I'm talking about. If you're translating it directly, it's not going to make any sense. And that's sometimes why when you're reading you know, the, 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 you know, the King James Version, that you're struggling because they try to translate it directly word from word, and people don't talk like that. And so uh, here's an example from the Bible. In the King James, Romans 12 and 20, said, says coals of fire, right? No one would say that now, but no one would say it then either. In the 1600s, no one, no one would say coals of fire. Go search literature from the 1600s, and you will never see that phrase, coals of fire. But they tried to translate it straight from the Greek into English. Literal, formal, equivalent translation, and it causes a little bit of confusion, okay? So the NIV translates it, burning coals. And then the REB live coals okay that's what it's burning coals that coals are hot they're warm is what's being conveyed in Romans 12 and 20 but when you saw coals of fire it caused a little bit of a, uh, a misunderstanding the English sometimes is not clear another example 2nd Corinthians 5 and 16 the New American Standard Bible which is also an attempt at a literal translation translates it according to the flesh okay now, I know many people have read this, and they're thinking, skin, okay? Because, you know, I even remember in the church, almost like our flesh is sinful. But that ain't what it's talking about. NIV translated, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. That's what it's talking about. That's what Paul is referring to in the original Greek. And, okay, so what it's doing is just putting it in modern language that we can understand. It's bringing understanding that could be lost in the, in the more literal, uh, formal equivalent translations, okay? Now, the problems with free paraphrase translations, okay? I, I never, ever, ever, ever suggest anyone have a free translation as their main Bible, okay? Because it changes <laughs> too much. It's too free, Okay? The, tr the, the translator updates too much of the original author. I don't know if you've ever read the message, okay? Which I'm not saying anything, you know, you can't read it, but it just shouldn't be your main Bible because it just, it really goes a little bit further than it should. It makes it very, very difficult to study the Bible when you're using a paraphrased version uh, because it's, it's changing too much. And again, they're more like a commentary, really, than to me than they are a Bible. Okay. So again, my suggestion, functional equivalent, 
formal equivalent, free, or dynamic literal paraphrase. Now, we're going to talk about some of the uh, distant issues. We talked about when they're translating, they have this problem with historical distance. And we're going to talk about different categories and how each of these versions uh, handle this. All right? So the first thing, weights, measures, and currency. Okay? Now you think, well, what's the big deal? Doesn't everybody use pounds and inches and, and feet? Not even today. Okay? In fact, you know the only people that uses the standard system? The United States of America. And not even our government. Just the people. Okay? You go in the military, you're going to use the metric system. And so, uh, I mean, e even me, because I've lived overseas for so long, I still think in kilometers, meters, uh, and that kind of thing. Because when someone will ask me how so long, it's, I'll say, oh, it's about 100 meters. And then I have to realize, okay, the people don't use that as much here. Uh, but when you're translating them from the original language, sometimes it's hard to, you know, do, do, do when I'm translating, if I'm a translator, do I translate it the way it was then? Or do I try to find a modern equivalent to bring understanding? Okay? And so instead of saying the currency of the day, or if I say a year's wages, instead of how many uh, drachma or whatever. Because if, you know, if, it, if it says that, how many of us know how much that is? And again, we're looking for understanding. Okay? One of the problems with this, they can change over time. Okay, especially when you're getting into how much something's cost or how much something's worth. <laughs> okay, I think all of us realize in the last few years that has changed. Okay, you know the cost of eggs four years ago and the cost of eggs are now you know has changed. And so some of these things change over time. And if you're making a Bible translation, you're not translating the Bible thinking, oh, they'll use this for two years and then we'll do this all over again. No, you're wanting it to last for a good period of time. But you got to realize if I change. If I try to put this in a modern equivalent, what's going to happen if 10, 15 years down the road, that changes? And you have to think about that. Also, again, they're not the same across the English-speaking world. Americans, British, and uh, Australians, and other English-speaking people, it's, it's different. And in, you know, until you are around other people's English, you will never even grasp how really different it is. Okay? If you go to Mario, England, you will understand every word they use and then at times have no idea what they're talking about. Even though you understand the word, you don't understand how it's being used. And this is true with Australian English. This is true with Emirati English. Uh, in the UAE, we had something we called UAE English. And, uh, and it was just a... Because you had all these cultures from all over the world, and you had you know, from people from 182 countries in this one area, and even in Arabic, there's all different kinds of Arabic. So when they come to the United Arab Emirates, they all speak English. But they all don't speak the same English, okay? Uh, in our church, we had a significant number of Indians. Now, I can, now, I can understand an e Indian very easily, but you probably can't unless you're around them. And it's not, it's not, that's not, a, that's not a racist thing. It's just true, okay? It's just a thing of, you know, they, they speak a little different. They put the, the accents in different places and that kind of stuff. And honestly, sometimes their English is probably better than mine, but it's a thing of, uh, it's hard sometimes to understand. And so, those are things that can happen. Also, euphemisms. Uh, oh, this is a, that's a second part. Go back to this for a minute. Uh, again, not all the English-speaking world uses the same metric system. Again, metric and standard is, is... And then in England, too, they have something that they'll call stones. I don't even know what that's called as far as that, that, that type of... It's, it's, it's not standard, and it's not metric. It's something completely different. I remember when I was a kid, when they, in the schools, when they tried... I think they tried to move from standard to metric, and people said, I'm not doing that, you know. And... Uh, in a lot of ways, I, 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 you know, it is easier in the sense that it, you know, it works in, in groups of 100. But the only thing that I could never actually ever shift to in my mind in the metric system was Celsius. I could never actually move to that in my head. I still always thought. Uh, but anyway, in this, in this area, the King James and the New King James Version are not consistent. Sometimes they translate it different ways, and there's not consistency there. 
uh, the 2011 NIV is very, very consistent in this area. Okay? Now, the next thing, euphemisms and idioms. This is the you know, things we're talking about like sex, sexual issues, going to the toilet, uh, hygiene, female hygiene issues that the Bible does address. And how you translate that can get very, very different because if you, if you look at it literally from the Bible, sometimes the way it translates it might not be appropriate for me to say from behind that pulpit, all right? If you translate it literally, I mean directly, it would confuse the reader, okay? A, a good example of that, a man knowing his wife, okay? Now, if you've been in the church a while, you, you, you've probably heard it talked about that knowing means intimacy, okay? It can be sexual intimacy, but it can also mean other things, and, uh, and so, you know, it, it just means a deep, deep intimacy between a man and a woman, and that, use, that word know is also used when it talks about us knowing God, that it's supposed to be an intimate, deep, intimate relationship. And, but the word know is there. And so if you're, if you're a new Christian reading the Bible and it says a man knows his wife, you'd be like, of course he knows his wife. He married her, didn't he? You know? uh, and that's not what it's talking about. And, and how we're going to translate this so that it's not confusing, it's not offensive, uh, and that can even change from culture to culture. Okay? Uh, things that we could talk about here, I could not talk about in Dubai. You do not talk about things, sexual things, in mixed company in the Arab world. That is, that's a taboo. That's a no-no. Uh, and, but at the same time, what we think is okay, go visit an African-American church and listen to how they will address these issues. They're much more free in discussing some of these issues, which might offend us. Uh, and so it's a thing of, you know, some of these issues are not racial. They're cultural. And we have to kind of understand, understand that, okay? If you do a formal equivalent, you could offend. And again, the functional equivalent is probably the best choice with these sensi sensitive issues. But it is possible that the translators end up missing the, uh, the real meaning of the idiom. No? Example, 1 Corinthians 7 and 1. In the King James Version, it says, It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Okay? So, on Sunday, I want all the men to sit over here and all the women to sit over here. All right? Carrie and I would do that when we'd go visit churches and we'd have all our Arabic clothes on and I would sit on this side and her and the girls would sit on this side. And you, could, you could tell it's like the church was like, what in the world are they doing? Uh, the NIV first edition, the original NIV and the GNB translates this, it is good for a man not to marry. The NIV, NAB, I'm sorry, whoop, translates this, a man is better off having no relations with a woman. And then the NIV 2011 edition translates this, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. And this is actually, in the original Greek, the best of the four, okay? The best of the four. And so you can just see the, the difficulty the translators have in trying to translate these things. And some of the things that they got to think about, that when we go and we're reading the Bible or we're buying an you know, English translation, we don't think about it all, okay? Uh, but they have to. Some other areas of difficulty, vocabulary. Finding the right word makes translation, translation so difficult. And, and what, okay, what word was Paul using? Why was he using that word? How was he using that word? And then what word can we use in English that conveys the same thing? And that, that's very, very difficult. Part of the difficulty is not only in choosing the appropriate English word, but also choosing a word that is not already filled with connotations that are foreign to the original word, the original language. Uh, and we do this all the time. What loaded words. And in our world today, where everybody gets offended by everything, this is even more of an issue. Because oh, if I use that word, will it offend? I mean, I, when I wrote my doctoral dissertation, I have almost an entire chapter on vocabulary. That when I use this word, 
this is what I mean, okay? Because someone else writing the paper could use that word and it mean something a little different. And because of the fluidity and the, uh, the vagueness and the ridiculous uh, aspect of, uh, of a lot of our cultural issues today, we got to define almost every word we mean. You know, every word we say, because, you know, even like tolerance, that word's got to be defined today. We, you just can't throw that word out there, because it means a whole lot different things to some people than it means to me, and we have to be very, very careful, and so do, so do translators. Some is that Greek and Hebrew's wide range of meaning, we don't have anything in English for that. Greek and Hebrew, I mean, in Hebrew and God knew this, were perfect languages for the Bible to be put in. They were, they're so rich in vocabulary, so rich in grammar, so rich in how they you know, express themselves, that in English we, just, we fall so far short. Uh, and translating the Bible from those languages, those almost perfect theological languages, into our language, which is really just a combination of three languages, uh, it, is, it, it makes it much more complicated because sometimes this word in Greek cannot possibly be expressed in English. And, and this, this goes in translating back and forth with modern languages too. There is a word in Chinese, very, very common word, used a lot, uh, guanxi, not, yeah, guanxi, right? Guanxi, yeah, guanxi, right? You know what that means, right? Well, I would tell you, but it won't translate into English can't translate it. There's no way you can translate that word. You could say reputation, but that falls so far short of what is conveyed in Chinese when you use guanxi, all right? But in China, guanxi is everything, everything. If you don't have guanxi, you're in trouble. And guanxi comes in many different, I know you're looking at me like, what in the world are you talking about? Did you drink cough syrup before you came here tonight? But that's what I mean. It cannot be conveyed in English. There's no way you can convey it. I could sit here and for an hour trying to explain to you what that word means in China, and you would never, ever be able to grasp it until you go and live there. Okay? And then you still can't grasp it. And so uh, this is what we're struggling with. There's times in which things, and, and I know you've always heard, okay, like three words for love in Greek, one word in English, you know, agape, eros, those kind of things. And then you translate them into English and you got just the word love. And then you got to think about how we use the word love in America today. Well, I love God and I love Starbucks. Well, surely there's a difference in those two things, you know. I mean, I hope there is. If there's not, then, you know, either you've lifted Starbucks up way too high or you've lifted God way down too low. But, you know, we have that struggle and we got to keep that in mind. Yep. Remind me. Okay, yeah, I remember now. Yeah. Yeah, for, for those who are watching online, Carrie brought up an example that I remember now. In, I was teaching in Germany, and my translator was, you know, our, our students learned either in English or in German, and I was teaching in the chapel, and I was teaching about the difference between guilt and conviction. And uh, in Germany, it's the same exact word. And so the translator was saying, almost like saying, the difference between guilt and guilt is and, you know, everybody, nobody was understanding, of course, what I was talking about, where in English, there is a significant difference between guilt and English. And biblically, there's a, you know, God never, ever, ever makes you feel guilty, but he will convict you, okay? And even with the word conviction, another word that you could substitute with conviction is convince. That when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, the Holy Spirit is trying to convince you that you have sinned, okay? And so... Uh, where in English, you could separate the two words very, very easily, but in Germany, you couldn't. Okay, again, Greek and English, the same, same type of things, all right? And then some have several meanings, and then some considerably different meanings. 
So any kind of play on words is impossible from the original languages to English. And again, this is true even with modern languages trying to translate back and forth. So word plays, they are almost impossible to translate. Almost impossible. And uh, again, this is true if you take Spanish to English, much less the original languages to those, right? Word plays are unique to the original language. And if you ever spend time around people who English isn't their first language, uh, that's, that's why you, I, I remember very clearly one time sitting in Beirut, Lebanon, and uh, I went to a movie while I was there. And, the, you know, it was a crowd of people, but I was the only white person in this movie. And we were watching it, and, you know, they had, had you know, uh, spoken in English, but then with Arabic subtitles. When I was laughing, they were silent. When they were laughing, I was like, what are you laughing at? You know, and again, it, it was things that are funny in one language uh, are not funny in another. I mean, for one thing, <laughs> sarcasm does not translate very, very well. And uh, sarcasm is my spiritual gift. So it's a thing of, I, 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 you know, it was sometimes, you know, when I would say something, the English-speaking, first language English speakers would laugh. The second language English speakers didn't get it. I remember one time uh, being in a class in Germany, and I was telling them, if you cheat on my test, I will cut your heart out with a spoon, okay? And one of the girls on the front, she was German, she translates directly in her head, and she starts crying, thinking I was really going to kill her if she cheated on my exam. And I had to explain to her after class, I'm like, this is a Christian school. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to actually literally kill you if you <laughs> cheat on my test. I will fail you, but... So again, they're almost untranslatable. Some examples, okay? Amos chapter 8, verses 1 through 2. The NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version. This is kind of closer to a literal translation uh, than it is a dynamic one. And this is what it says. And, I, this, and I'm sorry about the size of the font, but I want you to be able to see them together. This is what the Lord God showed me. A basket of summer fruit. He said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. Okay? That's formal equivalent, a literal translation. Now the NIV. This is what the sovereign Lord showed me, a basket of ripe fruit. That's what summer fruit meant in Hebrew. Okay? What do you see, Amos? He said, a basket of ripe fruit. I answered, then the Lord said to me, the time is ripe for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. And so the whole concept of summer, summer fruit in Hebrew means a fruit that has ripened in, uh, if we want to translate it into our language today. All right? Another problem area is grammar and syntax. Syntax means how words are arranged in a sentence, how they're, how they're put there. Okay, due to the differences in the original language and English, the issue of grammar and syntax makes translation by dynamic equivalent, by functional equivalent, dynamic translations preferred. It's easier and it's more reliable and it's more understandable. A formal equivalent translation or a literal translation approach will often attempt to use the original grammar when the modern language cannot, cannot handle it, okay? So what they try to do is they try to take something in Greek, use the original Greek grammar, but then put it in English, and English can't handle it. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't function. An example, okay? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the New King James Version. Word of his power is how it's translated. Because what it did, exactly... Exact, you know, tried to take it from the, from the Greek and put it in exactly the same way. Nobody understands it. NIV, his powerful word. And that's what's being said. Okay? So it just puts it in a way that when we read it, we're like, oh, yeah, I get it now. I understand. And again, understanding should be our goal uh, in, in the Bible. And the New King James and the King James Version have thousands of examples like this, 
uh, in the Old Testament, especially where the Hebrew word order was followed, making it almost impossible to understand what they mean in English because they were just they were trying to do almost a word for word translation, and it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work because it doesn't. It's not understandable to the reader, which again is our goal. Okay, gender issues, and I don't mean the stuff we're talking about today. Okay. <laughs> The Bible's very clear in that area, no matter what translation you're using. Uh, this is talking about, though, inclusion of women when the address in the Bible is meant to be universal. Okay, what I mean by that is if the author is trying to say all people, men and women, okay, or is the Bible trying to say only men? Okay, there are times in which, it, you know, you, you will see this in, in, in more current translations where it will say brother and sister, okay? Where in older translations, it will just keep it as brother. The reason that sisters was added was that that address was meant to be universal. And so it's trying to bring clarity that what Paul is saying or what whoever is saying is talking to men and women. But there are times in which he... The, the author is only talking specifically to men. And then you don't add sisters with, you know, or, or men and women with that. And translators have to think about that with this, this word. And you'll, you'll see this if you, you start comparing translations uh, quite a bit. Okay? All right. Choosing a translation. Okay. And again, this isn't all translations. Time doesn't allow that. The 2011 NIV, okay? This is what you will see if you attend church here on Sundays on the screen more times than not. Every now and then, I will put a different version up there. Uh, but if you do, it will always be marked, and you'll be able to see that it's a different version. This, a vast majority of scholars, the vast majority, the vast majority of translators agree that this version of the NIV was translated by the best scholarship and is as good of a translation that you can possibly get in the English language. And all these scholars who believe this are evangelical, Protestant evangelicals. Okay? If you don't know what evangelical means, we're a part of that movement. Okay? Pentecostalism falls underneath evangelical. All right? The next one. The GNB, the Good News Bible, the HCSB, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, and the New American Bible are also very good, okay? However, the GNB, uh, a single scholar translated it, okay? But it's still a decent version, okay? The HCSB, they were also evangelical scholars, Okay. It's, do, you, do we even know the theological worldview or persuasion of those who were translating the Bible? I would like for them to be similar to me. Okay. The NAB was Catholic scholars. The American, uh, uh, yeah, they were, they were American, Catholic, American Catholic scholars, all right? And then you have the NRSV and the NASB and the NAS. New Revised Standard Version, New American Standard Bible, and both of those are the same, okay? They tried to just update the King James Version by using superior manuscripts, which means older, that were not available at the time of the King James translation, okay? Of the two, the NRSV is far superior in this area, okay? It's far better than the NASB. The NASB is really uh, too literal of a translation, and it makes it very, very difficult for people to understand. If you've ever read it, it's, it's not that easy to understand. Okay? Now, the REB and the NJB yeah, uh, is the Revised English Bible and the New Jerusalem Bible. These are good translations. Okay? But the REB is from British scholars, and it uses British idioms that are not always familiar to us as Americans, okay? The NJB 
is an English translation from the French. So it was translated from the original languages into French, then it was translated from French into English. So two languages went through, which can make... And it's more of a free translation, the New Jerusalem Bible. Okay, so last, my recommendation. Okay? Do with it what you want. I don't care. You're not going to beat the 2011 NIV. It's just not possible. It's just not possible. Okay? Uh, and I would suggest that this be the primary Bible, and it is a dynamic, functionally equivalent translation. The second Bible I would suggest be the NRSV, which is a formal equivalent. I also like the ESV here. Uh, but the NRSV, I like a little bit better than the ESV. And then you could choose any of the free paraphrase versions because, again, it's a paraphrase version. It's more of a commentary. I personally use the J.B. Phillips, but it's only a paraphrase of the New Testament. I've used that in the service that you've seen. Uh, it's a little bit harder to get a hold of. You're not likely to find many digital versions of this. Uh, you might have to get actually a, a book version of it. But this is what I recommend. Okay. Any thoughts, questions relating to this stuff? Now, you ain't got to do this. Read whatever you want. I'd rather you read the Bible than not read it at all. I, I, I read, I, I seen something recently that in the United States of America today, People who claim to be Christian, only 32% of American Christians look at the Bible three to four times a year. 32% of Christians in America look at the Bible in any way outside of church three to four times in a year. And we wonder why the church is dying. Don't blame the world for the problems. Blame us. If we're not reading the Bible, if we're not praying, we ain't got no right in the world to complain about the world. None whatsoever. Because the problem's in here and the problem's in our own heart that we're not going to the source. And, uh, I mean, when I read that, I mean, literally, I, I cried. Like, that's almost unbelievable that people don't think we need the Bible. And, you know, and all you have to do is ask yourself how often you read it, and then you'll, you'll tell yourself how much you think you need it. Uh, but any questions? Jim? That's a good question. For those online, Jim asked, do I see, foresee an AI Bible? Absolutely catered to you catered to the individual I think you will have that uh, I mean you know seminaries and stuff are already you know kind of in scramble mode even when it comes to assignments you know I mean I'm sure you, you know you're with education because I mean plagiarism is a you know a difficult thing now but AI can be set up to almost you can plagiarize it and yet very hard to detect and so but with the Bible I would I I, I can predict it, but at the same time, if they, if, if, and, and if, when they produce an AI-generated Bible, I will be very, because it's only going to be as good as whoever programmed the AI, you know, and, and so it's a thing of uh, in what cultural concepts are you using in the translation, you know, some of these things. Uh, what theological persuasion are you coming from? I mean, you, 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 that all have to be programmed in, and you know whether it's coming from a uh, even a, from a Christian perspective or not. And and of course, you know if it's going to be produced, it's going to be gender neutral. It's going to you know those kind of things. And but yeah, sadly, I I, I can see that coming because I, I I've heard of that there's going to end up being AI pastors. In the sense that, you know, there's churches now in which a pastor, people don't come and someone's standing behind the pulpit. They're on a screen. Church fills up. 
there's no one standing there. He's, he's, he's pre- he preaching at one church, and five congregations are hearing him preach, and stuff like that now. And so uh, the whole concept of an AI, and, and I know sermons can now be done AI, where a pastor can get on a website, give the topic, push, pay a little bit of money, and immediately you get a sermon with three points in a poem. That's, that's, that's not coming. That's here now. And I'll just say this. You'd be surprised who uses it. Yeah, you'd be surprised who uses it. Yep, April. Sorry? Study Bibles? My, uh, for those online asking about study Bibles, I don't, I'm not against the study Bible. However, most of the time the study Bible is coming from a specific, not theological background, denominational background. And uh, that they're coming with a theological bias towards their doctrine. And then also study Bibles are usually only a handful of people, not necessarily scholars. I mean, I, ha- I have an ESV study Bible at home. And, uh, you know, when I look at the notes, most of the time it's accurate in the sense because most of the time it's just basic information. But sometimes when it gets more in-depth, you can tell they are biased towards a specific doctrinal issue that is not so solid that actually I strongly disagree that's actually biblical. But every time they will, they will slant their argument that way. And so... Uh, when it comes to basic information, if you're using the study Bible, basic stuff, I think it's fine. But when you're getting into deeper theological issues, I think that's when you need to consult commentaries, uh, reliable uh, commentaries. Because while it's always convenient to have a study Bible open and then you can you know, just look down and get an idea, uh, how do you know what he's saying is right? You know, and, and so if I ever have any doubts, uh, I will consult my commentaries. And there's been numerous times the study Bible was wrong. Uh, even, even in the choice of uh, the Greek description, it was wrong. And so, uh, but I, I, you know, I'm not saying don't use it because they are valuable tools. I mean, it's just like a commentary. If, you, if, you're, if you're looking at a commentary, there's times I'll get a commentary and I disagree with what the scholar says, and then I'll go to other commentaries and then sometimes that's when you have to make a choice. Uh, the better commentaries will say, you know, there's, there's this point, there's this point, there's this point. I feel like it's this or this is more likely. Or they'll say, we don't even know which one. But if you're ever looking at any kind of information outside the text and, it, and they give you more than four possible options, what that means, they have no idea. After four, there's no idea. They have no idea. And they should just say, we don't know what this means. And I think that's the thing that we also have to accept. It is obvious. God does not think we should know everything in the Bible. Because if he did, descriptions would be there. Okay? And, uh, and so you know, there's things we can think, okay, that was just for the audience 2,000 years ago. That is not for me today. In the sense, okay, like you know, we talked about, when Paul's telling that guy to pick up his jacket, <laughs> he ain't talking to us, all right? And if you think he is, then, okay, go get Paul's jacket because he asked for it and see if you can find him. Uh, but when, when it comes to study Bibles, always with caution. But again, I'm not, I'm not against them. Uh, and also, too, you can also look into, the, into some of the information of where that, who has developed that, what organization paid for it, and whatever organization paid for the study part of the Bible, their denominational view will be there. And uh, one thing that always comes out, unconditional eternal security, which means you, you're saved, you're always saved, you can't ever you know, walk away from God or anything like that. I don't necessarily think you lose your salvation. I think you can walk away from Christ. We still have free will. But it's a thing of any time that uh, organizations that promote that theological stance produce anything, it's always there. Very subtly, but it's always there. And a, uh, a person who hasn't studied a lot of that theology might not pick up on it because I've seen a lot of 
uh, churches that their denomination does not promote that viewpoint use the material that does promote that viewpoint. And, uh, we, you know, we just have to, to be wise in, in the resources that we use. So with, with study Bibles, just with caution. But I, think, I would say they're more useful than they're not. Because, I mean, a lot of times it's like, okay, uh, what, 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 does he, what does he mean by a day's wages? And you can go down and look. Oh, okay, I get, I get what he's talking about now. Or uh, different issues, but then there, there's times in which you're, you have an idea that maybe they're not correct. But, yeah. Anybody else? Yep. Hmm? The Prosperity Bible? Oh, I'm sure there probably is. Uh, oh, Joel Osteen? Yeah. No, he's definitely in the prosperity theology type stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a whole lot more theological issues coming out of that church than, than prosperity. But no, I, I, I really lament the promotion of the prosperity gospel. For one, the word prosperity does not exist in the New Testament. And uh, where it has been translated that in English, it doesn't mean that at all. And so it's a thing of uh, that, go that, that heresy has done more harm to the body of Christ globally than probably any heresy preached in the last 2,000 years. Yeah. Yeah. You can't read the Bible and believe that. No way. There's just no way. No way. When Jesus says, you know, hey, they hate me, they're going to hate you. And if you desire to be right, you know, righteous, you will be persecuted. And uh, I remember, I've been rebuked before. Uh <laughs> Because I am a person who has a considerable admiration for those who are willing to die for their faith. And I have been told that there is no way it is ever God's will for a person to die for their faith. And I've been told that by a prosperity preacher. Yeah. I've heard people preach that, okay, like if, if, if we're here tonight and a storm's coming, and a tornado's coming, and you hear the sirens go out, and you have, hey, seek shelter, that we shouldn't go down in the basement, we should go outside and rebuke it in the name of Jesus. You go ahead. <laughs> uh, I've also heard, you know, heard this preach, that if you go to the doctor, and the doctor tells you you have cancer, that the doctor is prophesying cancer into your life, and that you should rebuke him and go out and be healed. Question number one, why'd you go to the doctor? <laughs> Uh, if, you, if you actually believe that. And two, uh, the whole speaking things into your life, read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read it. Uh, it, is, it, it, is, it is taking Scripture way out of context. And we need to be careful. We need to be careful because uh, one day, each one of us will stand before Almighty God and when it, you know, and actually this is the, the text for, for Sunday and the whole thing about, you want to be a teacher? Do you really? I mean, basically, do you really? Because you're going to be held accountable. But see, we have to realize that doesn't just count for people standing behind this. That counts if you're sitting at a coffee shop and you're, sh and you're telling people, you're teaching someone something that's not from God, that you're saying it is from God, you also will stand before it. Because in that moment, you're teaching. We always see teaching as me in the classroom or me behind the pulpit. But every one of us at times serves that role. When we're, when we're discipling someone in any way or giving someone advice or counseling. And, and I, I, really, I really am terrified that we don't have the fear of God anymore. And uh, that we can say things in the name of God without fear. And, and I, you know, I've shared this from the very first Sunday that I was here. I have two 
fears in my life. One is to steal God's glory. I'm terrified uh, to steal God's glory. And the second is I ever preach or teach anything that's not true. And both of those have to do with I am afraid of God. And you say, oh, you shouldn't be afraid of God. He's your father. He's God. He's God. And I am terrified of preaching something in his name that is not true. And I have heard it again and again and again. People say, thus saith the Lord, and it doesn't happen. It doesn't take place. And nobody gets upset. Nobody gets alarmed. The, pre the preacher doesn't repent. Now, if you did that, and then you come back and say, look, I, I missed it, and I'm really sorry, and I, and, I, and I repent before God, and I ask for your forgiveness that I did that, and you know, may God forgive me, then okay, that's okay. But then they'll spin it and make it sound like what they said came to pass. And I've heard that in the last three years. Uh, and so uh, not anyone from this church, in, in this room, in this, you know, or in, on, in the room on Sunday, but I've heard that done where something was prophesied. It obviously did not take place, but then it was spinned as if it did. And I don't know, I fear God more than that. I just, and I think we all should fear God on that. I mean, another indication of our lack of fear of God is using his name in vain. Uh, God takes his name pretty seriously, and, and so should we. That I, you know, God is our friend. He is my father. Uh, he, he, I am his child, and he, and he loves us, and he's proven that love. But he's still the almighty God, you know, creator of the universe. And why I can go into the throne room boldly I cannot go into the throne room disrespectfully. And, uh, and I think maybe because now in today's world, kids will disrespect their parents. Maybe we don't get it. Uh, but, you know, like my parents' generation and my grandparents' generation, you wouldn't have done you, the things that kids say to their parents now. My mother would have never said to my granddad, you know why I know? Because she would be dead. <laughs> and I would have never been born because he would have just killed her right then. I mean, it would have just ended. Uh, you know, and uh, he probably would have done it and not repented over it either because, I mean, he, you know, he, he, he ran a tight ship. And, uh, and we've lost, I think because we've lost that, res that honoring of, our, of our, our biological mother and father, that falls down into also losing our respect to our heavenly father. Because if you don't re you respect your biological parents, are you going to respect your heavenly ones? And, you know, assuming that they were, you know, uh, godly people. Uh, but, you know, honoring doesn't mean, you know, as far as earthly parents, that you do everything that they say. It just means that you show respect. And uh, we need to get back to that. Anybody else before we close? I know what time it is. I don't care. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Penny said that God gets blamed for a lot of things. Her, her mom said God gets blamed for a lot of things that he didn't have. Oh, I'm sure a lot of times in churches, you know, Holy Spirit said, Holy, and Holy Spirit's like, I didn't say nothing. You know? <laughs> what are you blaming me for? Uh, there's a whole lot of bad things that the Holy Spirit's gotten blamed for. And he's like, I didn't do nothing here. And uh, now what we, sometimes I think what we need is some of that, you know, right after the day of Pentecost kind of things. You lied to the Holy Spirit, boom, go bury him. Wife came in, you lied to go, go bury him. I mean, read the first part of Acts and then come into church with a light heart about the Holy Spirit. Look at, look at what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit and some of the things that people will say in the name of the Spirit or uh, about the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, where is the fear? You know, where is the fear there? And... Because, I mean, I know when I read, you know, in the book, the book of Acts, that him just, they're dead. I'm thinking, God takes these things a whole lot more seriously than we do. But we need to. Uh... Yeah. But at the same, you know, but at the same time, if it was not for the grace of God, so go we, you know. And, uh... You know, I, I, I thank God for the, you know, the things that I've gotten to study, the people I've gotten to study under, the things I've gotten to learn. And at the same time, though, uh, while I, I'm grateful, I'm also fearful 
because I know where that comes, comes responsibility. And I think that's the thing. We want to pray for blessing, but we don't want to pray for the responsibility that comes with blessing. And, and that's, that's a thing that, okay, like oh, if you pray for a financial blessing and God blesses you financially and then you don't pay your tithes or you don't use that money wisely with stewardship, where's the fear? Where's the, where's the, you know, the respect? And, and whenever, whatever God blesses you with, he's blessing you in order for you to bless others. And so if you, you know, but at the same time, how you do that, there's accountability there. And, you know, God's blessed me with the opportunity to go get education, yet at the same time, because of that, I have the obligation to teach, but then comes the responsibility to teach truth. And, and to teach with the proper motivations and the proper attitudes. And that keeps me up at night. I mean, it, it keeps me up at night when I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I, I said that Sunday. Ugh, you know, God, are you all right with that? I mean, did, did, I, did I take that too far? I mean, every Sunday uh, and sometimes during the week on, on Wednesdays, I go back through all this and I'm like, there's times I feel like I have to repent. There's times uh, things I said or things that I should have said, things I should have brought clarity to. Uh, you know, when people, people in, again, I'm going into Sunday, but when people watch, I know a lot of people see you standing behind a pulpit and thinking, oh, I'd like that job. He only works one day a week, you know. Uh, try it. Try it. I'll take anybody's life, anybody's life, over what the responsibility that God's placed in, you know, in a sense of, Stress and, and the, the burden that is placed upon your shul- shoulders that you have to care for people's soul and uh, that you have the responsibility to speak for Almighty God. Yes, it's an honor and it's a privilege, uh, yet at the same time, the responsibility and the obligation comes with it. Keeps me up at night. It keeps me up at night. Anybody else before we close? Like I said, I can do this all night. So I miss two-hour midweek services. Alan. Yeah, for those on, you know, uh, watching online, Alan just said, you know, like when you're watching, if you're watching other speakers or preachers online, you got to be careful, and you also got to be like the Berenians. Go to the Word and see if what they're saying is true. Go to the Word on Sundays to see if what I'm saying is true. I ain't got a problem with that at all. And... Uh, and especially because of the amount, you got to realize anybody, anybody can be online. And there's times in you know, which I'm going through, and every now and then I don't listen to a lot of preachers uh, outside of, of I mean, because most of the time I'm like, if I have the chance to listen to a one hour sermon, then I have the chance to read and to study. And that's, I, I would rather do that. But, you know, it's, it's a thing of when I, uh, every now and then I will stop. And listen, and there's times I'm like, oh my goodness, the church is in so much trouble. And because it, sometimes it's very, very obvious that the pastor isn't studying, isn't studying. I know many pastors, and especially in blaming the Holy Spirit, who don't study. They say, when I get up there, God will give it to me. No, he won't. God's not going to reward laziness. The Holy Spirit's not going to bless laziness. And, and I guarantee you, if that's the perspective they had, and you hear them preach once, you've heard every sermon they've ever preached because they'll just say basically the same thing in different ways. And uh, Now, there has been times that I'm up there that the Holy Spirit does take me in a different direction, but he always does it in what I have studied. And nothing new has ever popped in my head. It's what I'm putting in through him and in him is what's going to come out of me. And, uh, yeah, be real, real careful who you listen to. And because I, I, I've been in services in which someone's preaching and you got the amen crowd. And I don't mind the amen crowd, those who are vocal. Uh, I've never actually required that. I never need that. I don't feed off that. I mean, I know, I know some preachers, it, it, it encourages them kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I've never been that way. But it's a thing of... Uh, They'll say something, and then, amen. And then they say something that contradicts what they said just before, and they'll say, amen. And I'm thinking, well, which one? You know, choose one. 
It can't be amen for both because they just contradicted themselves. And so you have to choose which one you want to amen because that means let it be so. And since both of them contradict each other, it can't be so. But I think sometimes we listen so mindlessly. Uh, and we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. It doesn't mean that you know, when they make a mistake, you know, there is no perfect sermon. I've been trying to preach a perfect sermon for 32 years, and I ain't got there yet. But I ain't going to stop trying. But I ain't got there yet. But it's a thing of, uh, it's, it, there's a difference in someone who you've seen, okay, they, they misquoted a verse or whatever, uh, or they stumble over some words. Or You know, I've, I've heard a, a pastor one time say he wanted to do expository preaching, and he actually said suppository preaching, you know. And uh, I'm like, well, I guess we need that kind of sermon too, you know. And, you know, those things happen. But it's when, some, when you can tell someone hasn't prepared and then they're contradicting themselves theologically that they just haven't spent time in the Word. And my job as pastor of Kincaid Church of God, first and foremost, is prayer and the Word. Before hospital, before anything else, prayer and the Word. That's my job. That's, my, that's what I answer God for, and that's where I will spend a majority of of my time and uh, because I will stand before God on the last days and at the end and he'll ask me well, what did you do with this honor and this privilege that I gave you and I want to hear well done not uh, anything else you know. anybody else okay. alright let's pray dear Heavenly Father Lord we thank you again we thank you that we have the ability to learn. You gave us our mind. You gave us our memory. You gave us opportunity. There are places in the world where people cannot gather like this. There's places in the world where if they do, their life is actually in danger when they are together. But we have the freedom. You chose for us to be born in America. You chose that. And because of that, you've given us enormous blessing and enormous uh, opportunity, Lord God, to draw closer to you because we are English speakers. You've given us materials and resources in our language in which we can study your word at depth and at length and we can learn so, so very much. But also, again, God, where you've given these things, there's also responsibility and obligation that comes with it, that with this freedom, that we also have the freedom to share it. We also have the freedom to tell other people. We often have the freedom to spend our time in your word instead of our, our time uh, doing things that are not as important. And I just pray, Lord God, that we will take your word very, very seriously. That we will not get trapped into traditions and, and the things of this nature. We will not become unteachable, Lord God, but we will continue trying to learn more and more and more about you so that we can know you more intimately more and more each and every day. And I pray that each one of us, even those people who are listening online, that you will give us a hunger and a desire and a passion to study and to read and to engage your word that we may know you, our Father, our Savior, our Comforter, more and more and more. And we pray this in your name. Amen.